<laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's a true pleasure to see you all here. It's a wonderful and unexpected turnout. And I'm going to speak about something that concerns all of us. You may have heard about Zen. You may have heard about the notion of uh, Buddhist view on life and death. Yet tonight I want to talk about something as close and elusive as our notion of self. For therapists, it's a golden subject. You can dwell on it for decades, and yet you do not finish. Zen means that you do not trim the tree by the leaves, but you get to the very root where that tree comes from, and that's what we are attempting tonight. As long as humanity woke up to itself or ourselves, we ask the question what we are or who we are. And it seems that the answers are not satisfactory. In the 20th century, East and West started to meet. Oriental teachings started to come to the West and Western ideologies and politics started to go to the East. And what we are here or where we are now is actually a crossroads. The crossroads of a combination of views and traditions starting thousands of years ago and converging in the 21st century. If you look at the West, we had three primarily important people who shaped the religious view of the Western Hemisphere. In order of appearance, the first was Moses. He created the first blueprint of monotheistic religion based on some Egyptian tradition that has been lost since then. Next was Jesus. A bright and wonderful teaching with a very controversial heritage. Next was Muhammad with another flavor of monotheism, uh, much, much energy with a lot of homework to reconcile. But what we can see in the West, that there is the identity of God in whatever way formulated, and then the identity of man, human beings, whether created by the blueprint of a divine plan, or just by God's free will. There are many theories of creation. But one thing you can probably agree on, that you cannot verify the other end. Unless you go up there and find the agent that created us, it's an open-ended statement. Why am I quoting that? Because that's where the first notion of self, human being, comes from. That's what people read in the Talmud and the Torah and the Bible and the Quran, and that's the earliest conditioning and education of what we think we are. And therapists can probably agree, it's the largest set of projections ever made. Largely unverified. What started to change? After centuries of dark ages, we started to turn our energies inwards and study the self as an object of science. And that's when psychology came up, almost 100 years ago, but more vividly, about 50, 60 years ago, so that many schools would appear and study the self. But our notion of self depended on our notion of God as well. So God is something immutable up there, and so are we in our ego, immutable, but certain details can change. We can change our anxieties, our hopes, our fears, anything as a part, but you cannot change the whole because, to quote uh, a French philosopher, it's a tabula rasa. And on that, you etch the markings of your fate, of your life. And that is the root of behaviorism. When you have something already born with you, that's the driving force of your life. We call that rationalism. So the form and the content, rationalism, behaviorism, creationism, and evolutionary theories, they all converge and sometimes collide in our Western thinking. And my 
proposition here tonight is that unless we resolve the central notion of self, we will never get to the root of it. Now, in the 20th century, uh, we got a supreme aid from the Orient. And that was a plethora of uh, Oriental notions coming to the West. Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, you name it. Now, if you want to compare the founders of Oriental thought to the West, then you can also name three people, also in order of appearance. Shakyamuni Buddha, 2,550 years ago, he was born as a Hindu prince. He leaves home, goes into the forest, and finds something really fundamental and paradigmatically new to our question of self. He gets enlightenment, he attains complete emptiness or empty completeness, and realizes that the ego originally does not exist. It is created, but not by someone or some things up there, but by our own mind. That's a game changer. It took centuries for us to get that, and still the West hasn't really absorbed it, but we are on a very good path. Next was uh, Lao Tzu, who was the founder of Taoism. Taoism meant you return to nature, and not just nature as rocks and trees and animals, but our own true nature as human beings. So when you read the mystical part of Taoism, that mysticism is not about something esoterically remote. It's something deep inside of us that is akin to, if not equal to, the non-self or the non-existence of the ego that the Buddha found. And Confucius was the third one, a few hundred years after Lao Tzu. And uh, he found that no matter what you think you are, the most important thing you should define is your relationship to other human beings. So he left a set of very in important and fundamental rules that if you're a housewife, how you should relate to your husband. If you're a husband, how you should relate to your wife. If you're a child, how you are to relate to your parents. If you're a boss, how you should relate to your employees. So, simply put, Confucianism is a social framework as well as a notion of ancestor worship. <coughs> family doesn't stop at the earthly realm. If somebody is interested in family constellation, you know that all too well. That your unborn children and your deceased ancestors, wherever they are, if you are in that family, with your mind, with your heart, you have an effect on each other. And you can establish bondage and release bondage in many ways. Family constellation therapy is one of them. So, three people in the West, three people in the East. A fundamental difference in the notion of self. How can you reconcile them? You, since the Greeks started to study the atom, we had a very perceptible notion of matter. And when the West started to study the psyche and psychology started to develop, we had a distinct atomistic notion of the self. Just like matter is comprised of atoms, society and families are comprised of selves or egos. Psychology purports to fix it. You have a problem, we fix you. We give you therapy, we give you trainings, we, we give you short and long courses of self-development, but we never got to the bottom what this self is. It exists because you have a notion of self. But the Orient says, originally, no I, originally, no ego. It is created by the mind. It is created by thoughts, perceptions, impulses, and various forms of consciousness. So where's the truth? Well, that's where Zen comes in. Zen doesn't tell you whether the I exists or not. Because if you say your ego exists, you make a mistake. If you say your ego doesn't exist, or you also make a mistake. How can you reconcile this paradox? Well, Zen thrives on paradoxes. In fact, when you practice Zen, you are encouraged to live your paradoxes and all your 
uh, internal unresolved conflicts and see them in one big mirror, your mind mirror. So you will never hear me say that it exists or it doesn't exist, but rather ask, what do you want? What do you create? What's your view? Because you know, not just from quantum physics, but also from your, from your family life, your view creates the atmosphere. Your view creates the result. It's predetermination, if not prejudice. So what is it that you create? Do you create a strong notion of I? Are you attached or identified with your thoughts and feelings? Your notion of past, present or future? Do you label this as I or he or she? If you do that, we are split into egos, like you can split matter into atoms. If you split matter into atoms, then this stick doesn't exist for you, only atoms do. If you split atoms further, only these tiny little subatomic particles exist. Because that's your label, that's your view. And if you split that even further, only energy remains, and then what's there from the form realm? Not much is left, only what we call substance. So Zen asks you, what are you? Not who. Who is already a projection? Who is something that you already made? But what is it that it's made of? Like you have ice sculptures or potware. So where is the mud where that porcelain was made of? Where is the water, the H2O, which froze into ice and you sculpted various shapes and forms out of the ice? So we have many kinds of personalities, but we have what we call human substance. Where is that substance of which our various egos are made in our own unrepeatable and irreplaceable fashion? Zen meditation means you examine these questions very, very clearly and very directly. Zen means you do not depend on any scriptures, whether Western scriptures or Oriental scriptures. You're welcome to read them, study them, draw conclusions of them. But these conclusions are all foregone conclusions compared to your experience of your true nature, your true self. That true self does not have a name or a form. It doesn't have life or death. It's not significant whether male or female, Oriental or Western. And that experience is the answer to all the questions and the solution for all the paradoxes that you harbor in your consciousness, in your heart, in your soul. To be happy, which is our primary concern as human beings, you do not have to get something extra or lose something superfluous. You simply have to change. And that change begins with your notion of self. So how can you have an intimate relationship when you build a wall? You can't. How can you be not relationship dependent when you do not draw borders? That's the other extreme. We love intimacy, but we don't want to be dependent on the other. So how does that work? Okay. So Zen does not formulate these declarations and definitions because these things cl close down the mind. And if you close down the mind, you cannot get to the absolute truth. You only get definitions and systems and boxes. And Zen encourages you to think out of the box. To have your contradictions together and not separate them. Good cop, bad cop, conscious, subconscious, good person, bad person. When you split reality like that, you are in for a rough ride. We call this the roller coaster of your karma. Everyone in this room has lived long enough to experience that roller coaster of your karma. And how do you stop that? When you hear this sound, there is no thinking, no feelings, no I, no rest of the world. That's when the roller coaster stops. It did stop for this astonished moment of a mild shock because. You didn't know what the end of this movement would be. But you can't have a stick all the way. I mean, 
can you imagine you would be hitting objects just to delete your dualistic thinking? I mean, you would be taken to a very nice institution in a jacket with buttons on your back by very kind and compassionate people with very large muscles. And these teeny little syringes with very calming substance, controlled substances in it. So it's just a demonstration, but how do you do that in the mind that you stop the dualistic notions that create all your divisions, all your ideas, all your suffering and happiness? And the answer is, you return to the place where there is no thinking. You return to the place where there's no life, no death. This is not something mystical. We have that at the depth of our psyche. So Jung himself, he stopped intentionally when he ventured into Tibetan Buddhism at the deepest archetypal symbols because he did not want to leave his own reference frame as a Western psychologist and a therapist. He talks about it. He says, no therapy is working by itself without a transcendental notion. And that transcendental notion actually means you transcend the notion of self. If you cannot do that, you can't fix your problem. Okay? But the other thing, if you only transcend yourself and you do not articulate your problem, you do not point at it and you do not define it karmically, then you cannot set up relationship between you and the other person. Because everything becomes the same mush, the same transcendental, just like this. And that's also wonderful when you have to go beyond things, but when you have to come back and actually work with your transcendental notion, then form again becomes form. Not just form becomes emptiness. Okay? So, the last half a century, in terms of our mind quest, has been supremely exciting. And there's, there's way, way more to go. Because we open the bottle. The genie is out of the bottle. The questions cannot be stopped, not just because we live in a global village and information reaches even the most remote corners of the world. I mean, when you see hamburger stalls in Nepal, then you, whoops, what's going on here? So, the dust of civilization goes up to the highest peak of the Himalayas. But even the highest and most remote wisdom can reach the last dust particle on Earth. That's the other effect that we've got. So what do we do with our internal questions? What do we do with this huge information flow that reaches us? And that's when the practice of the moment comes in very clearly as the most important thing you can treat yourself with. The moment is the most important thing you can have because in this moment your mind makes the decisions. In this moment, past, present and future converge and also spring forth. So this moment is the alpha and the omega of all your notion of self and the world and past, present and future and good and bad. So if you attain this moment, you attain everything. You lose this moment, you lose everything. Okay? So the oriental type of encounter therapy is Kongan practice. Because that's what we're going to practice tomorrow with those who venture to come in. We'll set up an interview room and I'll ask you questions that you cannot answer. Deal with it. I'll, if you, oh yes I will, trust me. Oh yeah. So, if you want to frustrate yourself over things that you don't know, you can. If you want to immerse in this not knowing, then you can do that too. We had Descartes saying, cogito ergo sum. And uh, that's actually half of the truth, and even that is logically wrong. Put the, put the other half there following the same logic. I don't think, therefore, I don't exist. Wrong. Because at this point, when I hit, nobody was thinking there was just a ta in your consciousness. And if that was true, everybody would have died. But nobody's dead. Everybody's looking at me with shining bright eyes. So, talk to me. So when that happens, that you think, you think you exist. And when you don't think, initially you might think you don't exist. But that's not true either. So when you think, you think. 
When you don't think, you don't think. Kongans are fearsome. Sometimes we are afraid of things that we don't know. Yeah. Well, it, well, if you're not afraid of the new, you can change. If you're afraid of something new, you will never change, unless you're forced to. Now, your view on life can be very helpful here. Do you want to be just kicked on your way from the butt by your own crises, problems, conditions and constraints? Or you turn your face ahead and you make your own choices? You have fear? Face it. Where does it come from? You have inspiration? Look at it. Where does it come from? So what's your direction in life? That depends on your choice. Right here, right now, at this moment. And that's why in Zen we practice the moment as this clear mirror consciousness that can reflect everything as it is. The stick is brown. The top of the table is yellow. There's dead silence in the room unless I talk. So when you have this moment fully at your disposal, then you can see how your mind works. First you see it like a distant train. You just hear some, sometime your, your mind chatter or you have some unarticulated feelings. But when you start looking deeper and deeper, the train comes closer. Then you see the carriages, the wagons of the train. Then it, as it comes closer, your mind stream deepens and then you see the windows of the wagons, the carriages. And as you come even closer, you can see the faces behind the windows. Who are the travelers? And if uh, you practice a little more, you actually board the train. And you can see inside what kind of consciousness you carry. What are the passengers? Who are the passengers of that train? And if you practice more, you get to the engine. And then you see that the seat of the engine driver is empty, waiting for you. And then you attain where you're coming from and where you're going. So Zen is very simple, but it goes very deep. And rather than giving you more speech, I would rather continue with your questions. Any kind of question is okay. You don't have to be part of any order of Western or Oriental thought or anything uh, special. Just ask your own question, whatever is on your heart. I'm wondering if the stick has some uh, meaning or something. <laughs> yeah, that stick. Enough? Yeah. <laughs> Good. More questions? No, that's it. Oh, you are easy to tame. I wouldn't be so satisfied with just this kind of answer. <laughs> I will leave it to you. If you want to come back to this question later, you can. Well, my question is a little bit harder, let's say. After you experience several states of mind or spirit... What how kind of state, I'm sorry? State of mind or spirit, diverse. How can you come back in balance again? When do you lose your balance? <laughs> when do you ever lose your balance? If you, I... do not have, if you do not have balance, if you are an extreme person, but never in balance, how can you gain it back? First, you have to see how you lost it. When you ask a question to me, you are talking to one of the most extreme persons I have ever met. <laughs> So, where do your extremes come from? And then you see how this thing swings around, you know? Swings, swings up and down, your karmic roller coaster. Now, if you are attached to the ups and downs, to your extremes, yes. <laughs> then you will never get back to balance. Because the opposite of the train metaphor is also true. You are on the train, but you have to find a way to get off the train. So it slows down, it stops, then you get off, and then you build up more and more and more distance. You don't stay on the train, but you have to get on, meet the passengers, attain the driver's position, and then stop the train and get off and perceive it standing without going anywhere. Why? Because you already attained how to turn it off. In Zen, that means you return to a point which is before thinking. Here you have feelings, here you have speech, here you have thoughts, here you have sensory perceptions. That's what we call the mental entropy of your energy. It differentiates down from your belly button. It differentiates in a different way. That's how we make babies. And that's how the physical entropy or procreation happens. But 
at the, your belly button or Muladhara Chakra in Sanskrit, Tantian in Chinese, Tanjon in Korean, or Hara in Japanese, there is no movement, there is no extremes, there is no entropy, mental or physical. That's why in Tibetan it's called the Mahamudra, also in Sanskrit. And that's why you hold your hand here. It's not some museum or copy of a Buddha statue. It has function, very deep function. You return your attention here. You attain not moving mind, not extreme mind. And then you perceive your extremes as if it was children's toys. But if you attach to them, if you get on the roller coaster again, then you follow the extremes again. Sometimes it's not bad. How can you love somebody if you do not follow your emotions? But if you are attached to your emotions, can you stop a fight? You see? You need both. Don't worry about your extremes. If you attain the nature of your extremes, you know how and when to use them and to what extent. And that has a key word, enough. So we are humans, we need the warmth of love and we need the firmness of willpower and we need sometimes to set very clear boundaries. But at the same time, we sometimes have to totally refer, uh, refrain from emotions, totally turn them off, totally reduce and re exactly shut down the system. If you cannot shut it down, it will do more harm than good. So find the on and off button and the enough you know, gauge. That's our job, and you can only do it at this moment. Come back to the origin and end point of all mental phenomena, and that's this point. What I demonstrate on the table, you attain in your own mind, and that's when you don't have to carry around the stick. You don't because your don't know is within you. We call that, in other words, Buddha nature or enlightenment nature. Some people call it the divine self or divine non-self. There are too many words and notions about it. But originally, you cannot think this. You cannot cognize this. You cannot even perceive this because that's what perceives, that's what knows, that's what thinks. Now, when you return before thinking, when your mind completely doesn't move, you attain this don't know. And that don't know is the antidote for any kind of extremes, because that's the off switch, also the on switch. But the on switch seems to be external causes and conditions. And another human being, she made me do that, he made me say that. Wrong, sweetheart. You made that decision, you just haven't seen it. When you see your own decisions, you stop blaming people, you stop complaining, you stop projecting, you truly attain who you are as a working concept, not as a fixed ego, but as a dynamic thing in relation with other dynamic entities. You can completely change. You can exchange every single thought you have, every, every single emotion you have, but it doesn't change your identity. It changes your personality, but your deepest identity does not depend on your karma. Okay? So that's plenty to, to know but it's not enough. It takes time, a lot of time. Uh, time. Time alone doesn't help you. Practice helps. So people ask, how fast is the way of Zen? And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the way of Zen does not have any speed mark or mileage. The reverse question I can ask back you know, to these people, how quickly do you let go of your attachments? Then Zen is very quick. If you keep being attached to your own ideas, your own ignorance, your own anger, your own greed, then Zen is very slow. And there's no time for the sake of eternity that can help you at all. You can be attached to your own wrong ideas for lifetimes and be reborn with them. And that's why we say this moment is the only thing we have. Let's use it. Let's use it to get enlightenment and wake up from our own delusions. And things, including relationships, society, whole civilizations can work very differently. There is no predetermined cause that we have to suffer. We make that suffering. And if you look at the news, it's not full of birth, old age, sickness and death. In fact, you learn about it. Many very famous people get sick or some newborn to famous families. But it's like a 5% section of the news. 
Most news is about war, famine, killings, uh, all man-made suffering that we could avoid if we were just a little bit more enlightened. We're not. We always reproduce suffering faster than we could wake up. So you will never make this earth a totally happy and habitable and harmonious place. It's an illusion. But you can get enlightenment. So if you do that and you make the effort, then you made the decision on which side of the problem you will be on. Do you want to be the problem or the solution? Do you want to be the patient or the therapist? That's a big decision. It has an impact on everything. So I think this is plenty for your question. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Back there. I actually have three questions, if oh, it's possible. My gosh. Three I questions know. all together? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, are there any good attachments? Yeah, we call that loyalty. Okay. That's the only good thing. If you're loyal, you're not attached. But bondage is necessary. And when you're loyal to your husband, to your children, you establish a conscious, mutually agreed bondage. Without this bondage, we cannot exist. For instance, when I became monk, I left home. That leaving home is not a physical point of no return. Leaving home means I unplugged myself karmically from all my family line and plugged into the monk's family or the Shakyamuni Buddha's family as we know it, as a lineage. And I'm loyal to them. I don't, I'm not disloyal to my past, but I know exactly where I belong. And this sense of belonging has loyalty. And that loyalty is mutually agreed upon and very conscious. Attachments are not that conscious. And attachments are attachments because they work detrimentally. You should be free, but you're not. Loyalty is you have to be in a relationship and you consciously undertake that and you assume that and you cultivate that. And that kind of loyalty is supremely important. Without that, we can't exist. And most of all, don't be attached to your notion of self, but be true and loyal to your true nature. And that loyalty pays back. You won't split. You will not shatter as a person. So loyalty and integrity, they go together, both inside and outside. OK? Next question. Uh, what comes first, emotions or thoughts? You come first. <laughs> then you make whatever you make. Next question. Uh, is there a meaning for the way you dress? I mean, for the way you... Yeah, I'm, I'm stuck in a fashion that hasn't changed for <laughs> 1700 years. Yeah, there is. This is a Confucianist shape and the Taoist color is the ceremonial, the kind of teaching attire. Tremendously uncomfortable. I mean, you can sit in t-shirts and athlete shirts. I can't. And I'm not blaming anybody here. I wanted it. I got it. That's it. Comes with the job. This kasa actually is from the Buddha's time. Just several parts. And the meaning of putting this uh, hugely uh, unpractical and uncomfortable piece of equipment on is assuming universal responsibility. So yeah, like you see the Milky Way as a huge tapestry, this is the tapestry of the universe and you wrap it around yourself. That's the meaning. Your life, your mind, your responsibility towards the whole universe. That's the meaning. I will call it the problem of the stick. The sticky problem. You, you did, you did the, the gesture with the stick. Absolutely. How will you deal with the temptation of being attached to this gesture? I mean, <laughs> let me finish. I already did. The attachment is I gone. Finished. Your bed. <laughs> I mean, um, expect, expecting something from this ge gesture can alter your experience. And I assume in every practice there is this 
temptation to expect something. You assume. Did you see that? I imagine, yes. I, I, I can, I can uh, imagine being in your place and doing the gesture. Don't do that to yourself. You shouldn't be a masochist. <laughs> well, sometimes I am. <laughs> if you are, yes. then the stick will hit you. <laughs> Yeah, I will like it. <laughs> well, that's why I won't. I return to the question. Uh, expecting something from practice can alter the moment. I mean, like... Significantly. It can totally ruin it. How you deal with this? You stop your expectations. You want to get enlightenment, you never will. In fact, expectations and assumptions work like this. You have a horse cart and a horse and a driver. The driver is very smart doesn't want to hit the horse. Horses are too fun, too precious, too wonderful beings to be it. Yet, they have to be motivated to pull the cart. So the driver has this long stick and put carrots right at the very end. So puts it before the horse's mouth and they say, oh, carrot, expecting that he will get it and pulls the cart. And as long as the cart is being pulled, the horse never gets the carrot. That's how expectations work. So, good horse looks back and kicks that driver off the seat. So, kick your expectations and all your dualistic and desirous and greedy ego off the seat. And just do it. Just do it. And when you do that, suddenly you find the entire universe became a carrot right in front of you. How do you do that? Better, how do you not do that? So, don't make anything. Don't hold anything. Don't want anything. Don't attach to anything. Don't identify with anything. Just stop. Have you seen this very important video on YouTube? Stop it. That's the best therapy you can ever see. The guy is exactly this. But saying it is not enough. Experiencing is truly indispensable. Otherwise, you keep assuming and inspecting, etc. And you have to stop all your cognition to actually get to the moment and get to your true self because you cannot get it outside, you cannot get it in the future, you cannot get it out of your expectations and assumptions. And we are good people and so are you. We want to get things done. We want to finish our karma. We want to get to the desired point and the goal and the summit and to love and intimacy and fulfillment and happiness. But. If you seek it outside as an object of your expectations, you will never get there. Never. Come back to the moment, come back to your true self, and discard all your illusions and don't make, don't want, don't hold, don't attach, etc., etc. That's why in Taoism they said, good teaching is bitter, correct path seems to lead backwards. Remember that when you subscribe for something very expensive and fancy and promising you things and treating your expectations as number one. Everything what you said, I not understood, but I felt it inside because I already felt like I was experiencing it. So I want to see if I'm not living an illusion of, Good. of what I and living. So I ask you the question, how will you know that you reach where you already spoke? In Zen we have tests. We call that kongans. I ask you a kongan and if you answer correctly, you know you're there. Okay. Zen master Joju visited two hermits. So he visited two pusniks. <laughs> If, if the Pusnich practices well, becomes a Sputnik. <laughs> so, he asked the first, did you get it? Did you get enlightenment? The hermit held up his big fist. 
Then Joju said, the water is too shallow to stay here. I have to go. And he's dismissed. No good. He visits the second hermit, the Pusnich. And he asks, did you get it? That hermit also held up his big fist. Then Joju Zen Master bows to him and says, you are free to give or take, kill or save life. You are beyond all the troubles and woes of the world. I bow to you. So the question is, why did Joju Zen Master approve of one, but not the other? If you think, you'll never get it. If you don't think, you just reflect, you get it in a nanosecond. And that's a proof that your intuition works well. And if it works well in this case, then I ask you another one, another one, and another one to test you from various angles. Everybody gets that, if you so wish. Intuition is a marvelous thing because you don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it goes. But mostly we cannot regulate it. And sometimes we confuse these impulses, this very clear, absolutely unprecedented and uncognized impulse with our own habitual thinking and emotional patterns. And that, that's when we go wrong. Okay? Coming back to the moment means you come back to this clear mind, no thinking mind, don't know mind, slash your intuition. That's how we define it. The Buddha teaches your Buddha nature, her Buddha nature, her Buddha nature, his Buddha nature, everybody's Buddha nature in this room is the same. So your intuitive layer is just as clear as the Zen masters and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in past, present or future. What's the difference? The difference is that we are still attached to our karma, we still have wrong ideas about self, we still assume, we still want, we still have the roller coasters because we did not clear our minds. When your mind is clear, even for one moment, you can answer this very well. And tomorrow, you should just endure that you don't know. And that endurance is the toughest thing. You have to realize everything you had known so far is not working. You have to touch somewhere else. You have to go somewhere else. Not to your education, to your conditioning, to your ideas, to your assumptions and desires. But back to something real, right here, right now. And when you dare to do that, when you become a child again in your mind, then you can answer. And that's a wonderful moment. I would not frustrate anybody for nothing. I don't take pleasure in it. But there is a way to answer it and you can find that. And that is the most amazing thing, the transformation inside from illusion to truth, from ignorant to awakened. I want to ask you if there is an easy way to stop the suffering. When you stop looking for easy ways, <laughs> then, Let's find a way. Is there a way to stop the suffering? Yeah, there is a way to stop suffering. You have to get back to the place where it came from. So first, you have to see your own hand in it, how you create your own suffering. And stop blaming other people. Stop blaming the world. Stop complaining. Stop projecting. Stop expecting solutions from the outside. Look inside. See how your mind functions. What you have in your heart. What kind of emotions and thoughts and wishes and deterrent you, know, you have. How you defend yourself. How you create your own notion of self. How you make good and bad. How you create your own dualities. And how you relate to other people. How you judge them. How you classify them. How you want to keep them close or distant. These moves are the key. And when you see your own mind functioning, creating situations, creating relationships and functions, actions, thoughts, emotions and speech. Then you see how that turns into suffering or into happiness. It doesn't work without examining yourself. So you should get back to the place where that suffering came from and use that raw material for something else. We have a choice. We always have a choice. As long as you have a body, you have a mind, you have a choice. And that's why we are born. We want to exercise that. It's the power of free will. How free is your will? That's the question. And if you practice, you can liberate yourself. You can attain true freedom instead of an assumed or idealistic freedom. Look at the French Revolution. If their idea of freedom was correct, 
Napoleon wouldn't have come. They would have had total and absolute democracy after just being in a big house and signing some papers. Instead, they had 25 years of bloodshed. They had the wrong idea of freedom and it never worked. So what kind of freedom of the will do you truly have? What kind of notion of self do you have? Do you perceive where suffering and happiness come from? Now, if you practice, you can do that. But if not, you're just fumbling around like a blind person in a chest of drawers trying to find the right thought, the right emotion. It's not going to work. It will work to a very limited extent. And that limitation is shown by your mistakes. So where does your mistake come from? Look at it. Look at cause and effect. And if you do that, you do, you do yourself and your beloved a great service. And not just your beloved, the whole world. That's what our practice is. There is no easy way or difficult way, but you can be more or less open to your own insights. You can be defensive towards the truth that you see. And that's number one big mistake, that you want to deny your own experience. Don't deny, don't defend, don't deflect. Look inside and see what you find and accept it as a relative truth. Relative because you can change it. It's not the absolute. But this relative truth is supremely precious. You see how your own mind, your own heart operates and how it creates suffering or happiness. And when you attain that function, that substance, where that function comes from, you can change that direction. Do you know what's the difference between a criminal and an innocent man? One wrong judgment call. That's how you make a difference between suffering and happiness. One phone call. One gesture. One change in your heart. A plus and a minus exchanged. Immediately suffering and happiness. They trade places. When you want to see yourself, like physically, you look in a mirror. Because I see a mirror in front of me. Yeah, it's a, but, that's a bad time, yeah. Yes, but when you want to see truly yourself, mm -hmm. I think you need a mirror to discover yourself. Yeah. Because what is in you yeah. is in the other one. Can you discover yourself without a mirror? Without an external mirror or an internal mirror? Without an external mirror that is your internal mirror. Don't confuse that. External mirror is made of glass and some paint. No, no, no. Not physically. I mean... Mental, mental mirror. Yes. You have your own true nature, whether clear or not, smudged by your karma or clarified by your own effort. And you need to use that too. But another person is your mirror too. A community and a teacher is your mirror too. Depending on how clear they are. Because they, they can have their own distortions. Now, if their distortions are less than your own, they can be your teacher. You cannot see a 100% nanosecond flat and clear mirror on this earth, simply because we are in this body with this kind of human mind. But there are people where the distortions are so minor that for you, it's 100% flat and clear. Because you're still on the roller coaster, and everybody you know, who is in the, your teaching position there's very little waves or no waves for some moments at all. Now, these people can help you. I want to ask for some clarifications, if possible. Uh, can you clarify, please, what is the difference between uh, no mind, no thought, and uh, what is called lobotomy Zen? You know? <laughs> so oh, very well, yeah. very well. Um, when you return to the mind which is before thinking, you see clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, everything is clear as a primary perception. And in that mirror, even your thoughts are clear and uncontaminated, unadulterated by other layers and interferences of your cognition. Cognition is not good or bad, but we confuse it. First, we confuse primary thinking with meta-thinking, because we think about the thoughts and the thoughts and the thoughts, so we layer it up. And we spoil our own stomach, because you think too much. Eat too much, have a physical problem. Think too much, have a mental problem. 
Next, we confuse thoughts with emotions. That's the number one big mistake. That's when relationships can break in five minutes. You confuse thinking with emotions, your projections go unchecked, and the other person is just hurt and devastated and mistreated very quickly. So when you return to the mind, which doesn't do all this, you have all the potential, all the clarity, and then you can start your cognition, any kind of mental process, whenever you wish. Now, lobotomy or the lack of uh, mental capabilities or being unfortunately a vegetable for the rest of your life is very different. I don't have to explain that. Okay? Thank you. You're uh, welcome. One more question, if sure. possible. Uh, you sometimes talk about uh, absolute truth or Buddha nature as being absolute. Uh, can you clarify that as well? Because I think uh, there might be some confusion with uh, Western notions of uh, a permanent substance. Or... Delete absolute. Absolute is a very bad substitute for this. I use it as a bridge. But please forget it. Originally, no absolute, no relative. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Your reality is the reflection of your inside thought. Thing. My reality? Uh, How did that happen? And uh, our, and your. Oh, 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 big difference. If only I see this stick as brown and everybody sees it as yellow, we have a problem. <laughs> uh, then why uh, they say that uh, you, cre uh, you create your reality and uh, the next uh, is um, the fact that we are here. Uh, that means that or we are here, we have uh, uh, something that in, inside, in our... Your thinking is very gentle, but it's also very pervasive. <laughs> so be careful what you think, because you follow it. It's not such a strong thought that I am right and you're wrong. It's very gentle, but you're in it. You're on the train. So I didn't say that only you create reality. Not only we do it. It's a co-creation. When it's co-created, the only thing you can do is you see your own part in it, your own hand in it. And that's what you, you can take responsibility for. You can help the person right next to you, but you cannot take charge of his or her life. Very important. Just like nobody can take charge of your life, they can only help you, but not solve things instead of you. So creation, in terms of creating our own lives and deaths, they have very clear limits. You can take charge of your life, Others can take charge of their own lives. Very clear. So, uh, if we don't entangle our own senses of responsibility, we can live in a very clear relationship matrix. If we completely mix up our responsibilities and sense of identity, then this relationship becomes a nightmare. A total nightmare where nobody is responsible, but everybody is responsible. Where you are trying to live your life, but you feel invaded by a thousand people. Because it's not clearly distinguished where your life and responsibility begins and where it ends. And how you do that, you see your own creation in this moment. What you create, what you make. Okay? Does this make sense for you? then we can take away this kind of very ambiguous or unclear concept of your reality, my reality, meeting or not meeting. Do you see this stick? I can't hear you. Yes. What color? Brown. Brown. Everybody agrees? Brown? Yes. Hooray! Wonderful. That's it. But by me, it's happened that I already, I already after five minutes, I forget all the face, all the names, and maybe next day I will meet the same person. They will gonna say hi to me. I, I answer all the time. But yeah. in the next moment, I ask myself or I ask the person, sorry. 
I don't recognize you. Or I don't remember. Okay, uh, please have your vitamin B1 level checked. I'm not kidding. No, it's not about vitamin. Are you sure? Yes. When did you last have your comprehensive medical checkup? This spring. This spring? Yes. B1 is okay? B6? B12? Sounds funny, but it isn't. If you don't have enough B1, your knees start to wobble and you can't walk so strong because your muscle tone decreases and your cognition starts to falter as if you had Alzheimer. But you don't have Alzheimer because you don't. It's just the lack of B1. Please. Thank you. I am not sure if I have or I don't have. I will never be the surgeon who decides. You have to go to a specialist. So I what, I, what I want to point out is the problem rooted in some physical phenomenon, like lack of vitamin or some tissue alteration and whatnot, or it's a pure distraction because you downloaded too many movies and you watch them all night long. Because you can have the same, you don't do that, lucky you. I know many people who do that. No, I don't do that. What happened? So it's a pure mental distraction or it has some physical root as well. You need to establish that. But if it's just mental, then meditation helps. If it's yes. physical, you need to see a physician. The treatment for this is just like for any other strong mental distraction, whether it's a roller coaster type of thing or a gentle mental entropy, whatever it is, but you return to the mind of no thinking. First, when you want to focus, it's not this stronghold on your awareness but letting go of all the mind objects and return to this clear mirror, this clear mirror moment mind. You can do that. Anybody can do that. Without concentration, one mind. That's Zen. If you have that, you are never lost. You're always here. So without effort, just being present. I have two questions. Great. I'm all ears. Go ahead. Okay. First question is, uh, what is the importance of the name in your destiny? How and how powerful is the uh, the choice of the name for your destiny? Because I saw that all the monks, also in Christian religion, uh, change their yeah. name after they enter in uh, sure. in, uh, in uh, service. No, and. Uh, is this has a, uh, is related to changing the destiny? This is the first, the first uh, okay, question. On. Yes, names have importance if you see their true meaning, the reason why your master or teacher gave that to you. And it's not your destiny, it's your potential. So you can realize the true meaning of the path through unfolding the meaning of your name. So it's a, it's a link, it's a bridge between who you are and who, are, who you are supposed to be. So the question was whether we could find everybody in this life what the Buddha and the patriarchs and other Zen teachers found. And the answer is yes. But if you are looking for their finding, you will never get it. It's the carrot before your nose. Never follow that. Look inside and find what you can find in your own heart. And if you go deep enough, it will be eventually the same, but you can never verify it substantially. You don't have your own enlightenment and the Buddha's enlightenment juxtaposed and a little you know, microscope examines. It's not going to happen. You can recognize it in different ways. How does your mind function? How does your mind establish relationships? How does your mind perceive and resolve situation? So you can see whether you are on the path of relieving suffering and awakening or creating more suffering and greed and ignorance and anger and all kinds of stuff. In that sense, you can measure it. But don't look for the Buddha's enlightenment because for you that doesn't exist. Good. You say go inside your heart and find the answers. How do you do that practically? You, you ask, what am I? Or what is this? And you turn your vision inwards, what you see. And that's it. And if you persevere long enough, 
you enter the mind stream. In Pali, they call that Shrota Apanna. This is the first of the four major states of meditation. The one who enters the stream. I demonstrated that with the metaphor of the train, remember? So when you are aboard the train, you enter the stream. You enter the stream of your own mind, this linear process of all your thoughts and emotions and everything that you make, the karmic river, okay? That's entering the stream. That's the first step. And how you do that? How do you drink water? Have you ever had a technique for drinking water? Now, if you try long enough not to drink like this, or drink like this, or drink like this, but you actually find it this beautiful, see? Awesome. Now, you can get it pretty much in the same way. We can teach you what's the cup, what's the water, what's the bottle, how to pour. That's what we do tomorrow. But actually, I cannot teach you how to drink. Meditation is not a technique. But we need this cup to hold the water, or this bottle, or the pipe. If we don't have that form, if we don't have that technique, I would have a real hard time, just like all of you, to drink this water, because it would be nowhere. So, technique is important, but we don't practice the technique. We use the, the technique to practice meditation. So you do it through meditation, when you say, go into your heart. Yes, we, we do, but I'm, I'm, I'm very careful with that. Because if we say we do it through meditation, that means we always meditate. Do you have a problem with that? No. Great. <laughs> because when you practice Zen, you will realize that 24 hours a day you can meditate without being in a trance or in a special position or whatnot. It's just keeping your mind mirror clear. That's all. So that's why the old teaching says, whether you are sitting, standing, walking, sitting down, or being in silence, talking, being awake, or asleep, constantly, without interruption, what is this? Keep that question. And with that, there is a phase when you say the question, that's why formal meditation is important. You say the question at every in-breath. What is this? What is this, that, what is this that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, tastes with my tongue, touches with the skin? What's that? Thinks with the mind, feels with the heart. What's that? So what is this? And when that verbal part has been ingrained and really became second nature, then you can leave the words out. And the question works by itself. You don't ask different questions. You can. You can. But that's a different application. Like somebody has an orientation problem. Oh, I don't know what kind of job I should choose in my life. So then, good Zen teacher makes it simple and says, work with the question, what is my job? Or what did I come here for? What was I born for? So, every single relative karmic problem, like relationship problem... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you go inside and say, who is this? Then you think about the other person. Because if you don't know the other person as well as yourself, you make a mistake. So, do you really see your beloved, your spouse, your children as they are? Or you have an idea about them, assumptions and wishes and all kinds of stuff that poison that relationship. And when that happens, you suffer and they suffer. So then you ask, who is this really? And then the picture unfolds because you're not there. You, your ego, is not there. Only your clarity is there. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? Wonderful. More questions? Yeah. How can we ask ourselves, what is this in our sleep? If you ask long enough in your wakeful time, then it will spill over into your sleep time as well. Like a dream? 
No, like an awakening from a dream. Like a lucid dream? Like an awakening from a lucid dream. <laughs> <laughs> Good. In fact, uh, we have other practices, not just the question, but like mantra practice. And people have, uh, long-term practitioners have the experience that when they're in a dream, any kind of dream, the mantra kicks in and they realize they are dreaming. And the dream doesn't have to finish. You just have your horse right under your butt, and that's a good feeling. And you can dream on, if you wish. But the dream doesn't control you anymore. That's pretty good. So you said uh, you have to, to destroy the war, that you can and, um, enter that. And how, how you can uh, destroy that war? Um, I said bring yeah, down the wall and transcend your own hindrances. Destruction is a very, very dangerous concept because if you destroy it, you may not be able to rebuild it when you need it. So the biggest problem with human beings is that they do not find doors on the walls. Therefore, they want to destroy it. And when they need the wall, it's not there. So a long time ago in China, there was a contest of Taoist magicians and great accomplished masters. And some of them went through the wall, some of them floated, some of them could turn water into something else. But there was an emperor who, were, were <coughs> who was supposed to say who is the first. And he appointed just one sentence and the carrier, the master of that sentence, as the winner. He says, this too shall pass. So, this is way more important than any kind of uh, special ability that those people displayed. And I'll come back to your question very soon. When somebody complained, this master went through the wall, unhindered. Why didn't you reward him? Then the emperor said, under the sky and on the face of this earth, human beings use doors to pass walls. So, don't think in terms of creation and destruction in this case. Think about the nature of the wall. When do you have to have your own individuality and your own responsibility, your own freedom, your own karma, your own practice, your own etc., etc., etc.? When do you really need that to help someone else? Or when do you have to totally merge with someone else? If you're sad, I'm sad. If you're happy, I'm happy. No walls. Total oneness. Total, absolute, intimate oneness. When and how can you do that? So that means you have a door. And if you have the key, you can open it. And when necessary, you go through. And when not necessary, you stay on this side. Don't destroy. It's not necessary. Okay? Any other questions? Will you come back? Will you invite me? Yes. Then I will come. <laughs> That's simple. So I want to thank all of you for coming today, for your precious and wonderful attention, your shiny eyes, receptive minds. And I hope to see all of you tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>